this is Matt Wilhelm from Invasive Species Action Network in Livingston, Montana. Today we're on the beautiful Yellowstone River and we're going to be sampling for aquatic macroinvertebrates. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. We invite you to come out and explore your watersheds. Get outside and get into these cool places. But when you do these things, make sure please that you're safe. Make sure that you have an adult guardian with you. Uh, while the Yellowstone River and many of our other rivers are beautiful and lots of fun, they can also be dangerous. Please always have a guardian there for safety. You know, come on out, grab a couple of rocks or boulders out of the river, turn them over and see what's crawling around there. Use today's lesson to maybe do some identification on your own in the future. Let's talk about the word aquatic, the words aquatic macroinvertebrates. So aquatic means they live in the water. Macro means that they're large enough that we can see them with our naked eye. And invertebrate means that they don't have a backbone. Pretty much everything that we're going to find today are going to be insects, but we might also find some worms, snails, or crustaceans. So let's get started. All right, so now we're all set to do our sample. Um, these aquatic macroinvertebrates, their habitat is down here on these rocks and boulders under the water surface. Um, they attach themselves to those rocks and they feed on algae, and sometimes they feed on other macroinvertebrates. You usually find more aquatic macroinvertebrates in the shallower water because uh, there's more sunlight penetration, which allows for more plant and algae growth. Those plants and algaes are what a lot of these aquatic macroinvertebrates like to eat. So without any further delay, I've got my net here. I'm gonna put it in the water downstream from me and I'm going to roll the rocks with my feet and try to dislodge these invertebrates and they'll get caught in my net. completed our sample and our macroinvertebrates in our net. We're going to take a quick look just to see what we have here in the net before we put them in the cooler and investigate more. So what we've got here is we've got several things. Um, this here, remember these have gills on them so you have to pull a bit of water in the hand. This is a caddisfly larva right here and this particular caddisfly larva does not build a case. Um, and they're pretty prevalent, it looks like, in the sample. I can see them scattered uh, throughout the net. As I look at it, there's quite a few. Let me break these. Oh, look at here. There's a, we got ourselves a stonefly nymph right here. That's a stonefly nymph. All right, lots of those in here. And if you kind of get your camera in here, you can just see that this whole thing, everything is just moving. There's stuff all over the place in there moving around, those were living on the rocks. So what I wanna do now is I wanna get these in the cooler, back in the water, and we'll look at them more carefully in a minute. Let me keep in mind that these aquatic macroinvertebrates breathe with gills, and the longer they're out of the water, the more stressed they become. So, you know, we wanna get them back in the water as soon as possible, because we wanna return these to the river healthy in a few minutes after we're finished with our lesson. All right, so we took our sample from the river. We put it in a cooler and brought it up here. And from the cooler, we put it into this big white basin. And then what we did is we, we found lots of different macroinvertebrates and we put them into one, two, three, four, five smaller basins for you guys to look at today. So now we're gonna start with identification, all right? And I'm gonna show you how to use a dichotomous key. So, when you use a dichotomous key, you simply don't just look for the picture of the insect in question. It's a process. You start at the top, and I've got myself a macroinvertebrate right here. All right. So the first thing in the, in the dichotomous key is it says, does it have a shell or no shells, like a clam? So we're going to go to no shells. And then it drops down. It says legs or no legs. Obviously, this has legs. We'll drop down to legs. 
And then it says 10 plus pair of legs, four plus, plus pair or three pair. This has three pair, six total. So we're going to drop down here. Then it says wings or no wings. This one has no wings. So we'll drop down further. And now we're down to tails. No obvious tails, one or two tails or three tails. This one has two tails. So we're in here. And now we're looking at more specific small print and tails long and stiff with long antenna. That's our stonefly. All right. So anyway, that's how you use a dichotomous key to identify macroinvertebrates. All right, now we're gonna talk about stoneflies first today. Uh, stoneflies live in rivers and streams. Very rarely will you find them in lakes. And as their name indicates, they like to live on the stones and rocks. Uh, they usually live in the highest uh, oxy oxygenated water. Uh, they live in pretty swift water and their body shapes and uh, their body structure is specially adapted to living in fast water. They have got flattened bodies. Uh, they have big, strong legs for crawling. They always have two tails. Their gills are located on their thorax area. The three areas of an insect, the three body regions are head, thorax, and abdomen. The head being where the antenna, the mouth parts, and the eyes are. The thorax is where the legs are and eventually where the wings will be. And the abdomen is where the digestive organs are, reproductive organs, and sometimes, like on mayflies, that's where the gills are. But in a stonefly, um, they like to live in the fast moving water. They always have two tails. Some stoneflies have a three year life cycle where they go, uh, where they live underwater for three years. Uh, and in their third year, they'll crawl out of the river onto the rocks on the shore and they'll shed their exoskeleton. Keep in mind, these are invertebrates. They don't have a backbone or an inter internal skeleton. They have what's called an exoskeleton or an outside skeleton. And many of you may have been on the river, our rivers in the fall and summer and have seen the stonefly exoskeletons on the rocks and boulders just at the water's edge. After the stonefly uh, sheds its exoskeleton, it, its wings will dry out and males and females will reproduce and the females will fly back to the water to lay their eggs where the whole life cycle starts over again. Uh, stoneflies are the most sensitive of all of the macroinvertebrates. Uh, they do not uh, deal well with uh, poor water quality, pollution. They need high oxygen. Uh, they need really cold water, clean water to, to survive. Um, they're a key uh, barometer or indicator of watershed health. When you have a strong population of stoneflies in your river, that means that your water is really, really healthy. Stoneflies have an incomplete life cycle, which means uh, they start out as an egg. The egg hatches into a nymph. The nymph lives underwater until it's mature and ready to emerge and go through metamorphosis as an adult. So the incomplete life cycle of the, of the stonefly is egg, nymph, adult. All right, now let's switch it up and let's talk about mayflies. Uh, mayflies have an incomplete life cycle, just like the stonefly, which means they start out as an egg, turn into a nymph, and then directly into an adult. Uh, mayfly habitat includes rivers, streams, creeks, and also uh, many mayfly species will live in lakes. Uh, as far as identification purposes go for mayflies, um, they can have two or three tails. Most of our species here in Montana have three tails, but every once in a while you find them with two. But well, one thing that they always have is they have their gills located on their abdomen as opposed to the thorax uh, of a stonefly. Mayflies can be broken into four behavioral groups, uh, burrowers, clingers, swimmers, and crawlers. We don't have very many burrowers in Montana because of our rocky, stony stream bottoms. Swimmer mayflies are often very sleek and slender. Um, they will often take their tails and lock them together as a single paddle to help propel them through the water. Clinger mayflies, which we have quite a few of today in our sample, have a flattened body um, and they're meant to live in the fastest currents. Uh, and it makes sense because that's where I took the sample from. It was, it was in a pretty quick current. Uh, so clinger mayflies have a flattened body and they're made to cling onto rocks so that the fast currents won't sweep them away. Crawler insects are uh, 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 adapted with, with kind of big, strong legs and they crawl about on the bottom. And those big, strong legs often have hooks 
uh, at the end of their uh, legs to help them hold on in fast current. And those crawlers will, cr will crawl around grazing on algaes and plants. Uh, mayflies have a little bit of a different uh, life cycle when they go through metamorphosis from the nymph to the adult. Most mayflies will swim up to the surface of the water and they'll shed their exoskeleton at the water surface and then they're called an emerger. When they're on top of the water, their wings will unfold and kind of stand up like a sailboat. And the wings have to dry. And on a sunny day like today, they'll dry pretty quickly. And on a cloudy, wet day, it'll take a long time for them to dry. But after the wings dry, the insects, the mayflies, will fly up to the trees where they'll shed their exoskeleton a second time. The mayfly has two parts of its adult life cycle. The first one is called the dun. The second part that I'm talking about now is called the spinner. It sheds its skin that second time becomes a spinner and now it's mature and can reproduce. The females will come back to the water with their eggs, drop their eggs on the water where they'll sink to the bottom. And soon after the females um, uh, lay their eggs, they die or expire on the water surface and the whole life cycle starts over again. All right, so now let's move on to caddisflies. Caddisflies have a complete life cycle Meaning they start out as an egg, they turn into a larva, the larva then turns into a pupa, and then the pupa turns into an adult. So this has an extra stage to its life cycle. Uh, the pupa stage is where a really significant transformation takes place called metamorphosis. And you can think of this like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Caterpillar. Uh, which is the larva, builds a chrysalis, and in the chrysalis the pupa forms and changes into a butterfly which emerges from the chrysalis. Caddisflies do a similar thing. Uh, caddisfly habitat are rivers and streams mostly, but every once in a while you find them in lakes. Um, they like to live on the rocks. They're very poor swimmers. Uh, they don't have uh, really any discernible tails. Um, some caddis are free living, meaning that they don't build a case and some caddis species build a little case around themselves. Uh, because these have a complete life cycle, the ones that build a case are pretty, pretty cool. They um, use the case as their cocoon. They'll pull themselves down into their case and they'll close themselves in and they'll go through their pupa stage. Now, when they're ready to emerge into an adult, they'll rise through the water, but they're very poor swimmers. So, Mother Nature, being the great lady that she is, when they're going through metamorphosis, gases will build up around their body during this process. And when the pupa breaks through, it rides bubbles of gases to the surface, bringing them to the surface in a hurry. They will break through the surface on that bubble, and then the adults will fly up into the trees, and they'll reproduce, and the females will fly back to the water, lay their eggs, and the life cycle will start over again. Some caddis species females will actually dive down under the water and actually deposit their eggs on rocks or logs or sticks or vegetation to help ensure uh, the safety of their, their young. In the scientific community, there are certain species that are uh, called indicator species. Indicator species tell a story or indicate something about their surroundings. Um, as far as aquatic macroinvertebrates, aquatic macroinvertebrates go, um, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies are indicator species of how healthy or unhealthy the water is. If your stream or river has a strong population of mayfly, stonefly, and caddisfly, that indicates high water quality, it indicates uh, low pollution, um, and an overall healthy aquatic ecosystem. So this concludes today's lesson on aquatic macroinvertebrates from the Yellowstone River just south of Livingston, Montana. The whole staff of Invasive Species Action Network would like to thank all of you for viewing this lesson today. The goal of Invasive Species Action Network is to stop the human caused spread of aquatic invasive species. And we ask that you do this through doing three simple things, cleaning, draining, and drying your fishing gear or watercraft after each use to help stop the spread of aquatic invasives. To learn more about aquatic invasive species or to view more of these lessons, go to stopais.org. Thanks a lot and have a great day.